and welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and uh, we are still in chapter 2 of 1 John. So we're in 1 John chapter 2, going verse by verse. And last time we ended up here in verse 6. And we talked about the Christian walk. So we went from verse 1 all the way down to verse 6 so far. So now, today, we're going to start here in verse 7. Now, verse 7 is quite an interesting thing here. Um... Verse 7 and 8, at first, appear to be a contradiction. Now, I do not believe in contradictions in the Bible. But the first time, the first time that I read this ever, I thought to myself, what? He says one thing, and then he turns around and says the exact opposite. Now, we call that uh, cognitive dissonance, when someone says one thing and then turns around and says the other. And for years, I could not figure this thing out. Well, I think I figured it out, and I can't wait to share that with you. So let's get into it without further ado. Look at verse 7. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you. But then in verse 8, he says, again, a new commandment I write unto you. And you're like, how can you say I'm not writing a new commandment to you? And then he turns around and says, now I'm writing a new commandment to you. Doesn't that look like a contradiction? Doesn't that look like somebody who's saying, no, I'm not going to do this. Now, I'm doing this right now, though, but the thing that I said I'm not going to do, I'm doing it. Doesn't that, for many years, that disturbed me. That bothered me because he's saying, no new commandment. But then the next one he says, now a new commandment I write unto you. Well, this is why we have to take the Bible at face value. This is why we must believe the Bible, and I do. And I don't believe there are any contradictions in the Bible. And it took me years and years of reading. And I just believe the Bible. And because I believe it, I realized it's got to be an answer. There's got to be an answer here. And I believe God showed me the answer, and I see this now. There's no contradiction, and I totally understand why he says, I write no new commandment unto you. And then I understand why he says, again, a new commandment I write unto you. And I can't wait to get to it. I'm, 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 I'm going to put it off a little bit, though. We're going to go a couple other places first, but we're going to get back to it. I'm going to show you how this is not a contradiction in our Bible. So let's read it again, verse 7 and then verse 8, the whole thing. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you. Now, why would he say that? Because they probably wrote to him and said, please write a new commandment to us. So he goes, no, I'm not going to. Because <laughs> we got all the other commandments. We saw that last time in verse 3. If you love him, you'll keep his commandments and things like that. So he said, so I'm not going to give you a new commandment. Remember, this is probably very late in his life. and He's about to die. And he's probably kind of saying, look, me and the other apostles, we've given you all the commandments that God said to give. Don't ask me for something else. Okay? But he says, Brother, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Okay? Then verse 8. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness had passed, and the true light now shineth. So here we are in verse 7 and 8, and some people would say, Okay. I'm not going to write to you a new commandment. Then he says, I'm writing a new commandment unto you. And they say, contradiction in the Bible. It's not. And I'm going to show you in a minute, or we'll get to it, how that is totally not a contradiction. And it's cool. I love it. I'm glad that God showed me this, and I can't wait to show you. But before I do, look at what he says here. I write. I write, verse 8. Verse 7, verse 8. I write. He says, write a lot. John was a writer. Just like Paul. Paul was a writer. Paul wrote 14 books. Well, John wrote the Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, his epistles, and then the book of Revelation. And it's just interesting. Go through here and look at all the times that he says, I write. Look at chapter 1 and verse 4. And these things write we unto you. I find it interesting. He says we. Who's the we? Well, there's probably some other Christians there with him. Then verse 1 of chapter 2. My little children, these things write I unto you. Then verse 12, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Then verse 13, I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him. Um, then go to 2 John, verse 12. 2 John 12. Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. Now go to 3 John in verse 13. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. So a lot of things that John is talking about, and many times John is talking about write. 
and writing and written. I just find that interesting. So he's writing to them, and again, I see that this is them writing to him first, and him writing back and saying things like, well, um, here's the answer to that. that. That explains the if. Remember, we looked at how many times the word if shows up? <laughs> they probably wrote to him and says, what about this? What if this happens? Or what if that? Or what if... And so he's writing back. So he's writing to them who asked him questions. So he's saying, you ask for a new commandment. I won't give you one except what's already written. So accept that as a new commandment if you want one. And that's one way to look at the passage and to make it not some sort of a contradiction in the Bible. He's saying, I write no new commandment unto you. Again, this is the new commandment that I write unto you. It's really the old one. So it's not really a new one. I'm just writing unto you what you already have. So take this as a new commandment, even though it's the old one. That I, it, that's one way to look at it, but that, that doesn't even kind of make sense. Well, look what he says there in verse 7. But an old commandment which he had from the beginning... What was the commandment that they heard from the beginning? Remember the context here in chapter 2. He's talking about love. He's talking about light. He's talking about God. He's talking about Jesus. And he's talking about commandments. This is the context of this chapter so far. What we've been going through and reading. In writing, and so writing, which is interesting, so something written down, something, I will put it like that, something written. So the context here is making you think about, well, what's he talking about from the beginning, something that is written down. Remember, John was with Jesus, so that made me think, let's go to John chapter 13. He says, you remember that old commandment from the beginning? And I'm thinking to myself, beginning? Beginning. Was this maybe the earthly ministry of Jesus? Could that be what he's talking about? Jesus gives a commandment in John chapter 13 and verse 34. Look at what it says. John 13, 34. Actually, 33. John 13, 33. Little children. <laughs> you go back over here to John. My little children, these things write I unto you. Little children. John 2, 1. John 13, 34, little children. It's almost like John is reading the book of John, and he's writing a letter, and he's remembering some of the things that Jesus said back then. Look at verse 33. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you. 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, and that ye also love one another. Oh! By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Okay, alright, let's go back now to 1 John. Now let's read this knowing that, and let's read what it says. 1 John chapter 2, verse 7. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Verse 8. Again, a new commandment I write unto you. What if he is going back to what was written in the book of John, and he's quoting Jesus, and verse 8 is a quote of Jesus? Then there's no contradiction. He's saying, look, I'm not going to write a new commandment unto you. Now, remember this scripture back here where Jesus said, Again, a new commandment I write unto you? <laughs> uh, okay, so there we go. There's no contradiction. He's basically remembering scripture, and he's saying, Look, you want me to write unto you a new commandment? There's no new commandment except the one from the beginning. And here it is. I quote Jesus, The new commandment I give unto you. Huh, okay. Which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. Verse 9, He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. And so it just it reminds me of the book of John. So when I look at this, I don't see a contradiction. I completely see him saying, look, I'm not going to write a new commandment, but I do want you to remember. You want to talk about new commandments? Remember the new commandment? I write unto you this commandment. That's the commandment. 
So that's the way I see it. And that's how the Lord showed it to me, that it's not a contradiction. Because he says, I'm not going to write unto you a new commandment. Then he quotes Jesus saying, a new commandment I say unto you. And he says, okay, but he says, right unto you, which saying is true in him and in you. Okay? Interesting. I just thought that was kind of neat. Now let's go look at Jesus' words again, too, in Mark chapter 12. And so often, as you read Paul, you see Paul speaking in such a way, and if you know the book of Psalms, and if you know Isaiah, and you, you see a lot of the words that Paul is using. It's like he's quoting Old Testament scripture. Well, here's John... And it's like John is quoting New Testament scripture. He's quoting from the book of John what Jesus said. It's kind of interesting. So the more you know the Bible, the more than you know that, and the less you look at that and go, oh, that looks like a contradiction. You go, no, that, he's just quoting another commandment that Jesus said. Mark chapter 12. Let's look at some of Jesus' words. Mark chapter 12. And look how these sound a lot like the words of John. Mark 12, 28. Mark 12, 28. So what is this commandment from the beginning? Could this be it that he refers to? Mark 12, 28 through 31. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So love the Lord God and love others. Those are the only two commandments. All right, so he's saying, I don't give you a new commandment. Remember the old commandment, love God and love thy neighbor as thyself. And there's the context all about love. So it's starting to come together, and he's starting to look at it, and you're like, hmm, I don't think he was trying to be contradictive. I don't think he was trying to be a cognitive dissonance. I think he was trying to quote Scripture. That's what it looks like when he talks about a new commandment and he's writing it to them. It's, hey, I'm writing to you to remember that commandment back there that Jesus said this. John 14, 31. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do, arise, let us go hence. So, a commandment, and it's, it's about love, has to do with love. So, it's interesting to see all these things in context all the way back in the book of John. John 15, 12. This is my commandment, that ye love one another, even as I have loved you. Now, 1 John 4, 21. Go to 1 John 4, 21. And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Wow, okay, so that's, a, that's not a new commandment, that's an old commandment. So he's not giving us a new commandment in that something that's brand new that no one's ever heard. He's saying now, this is the commandment from back then, which was new back then, but is still the old commandment that is for today. Uh, 2 John, verse 5. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. There it is. That ties it all back together. Back to John, chapter 2, and verse 7. Brother, I write no new commandment unto you. As though when he says, verse 8, again, a new commandment I write unto you, I don't see him saying, I'm not going to write you a new commandment, now this is a new commandment that I write unto you, and, and, and him going and contradicting himself. I see him saying, look, I'm not going to give you a new commandment, except this one over here, which is a new commandment I write unto you, Jesus said, back in his day. And the fact that we have Second John where he says that almost reiterates it again, and we just read it, where he says, I beseech thee, lady, not as though I write a new commandment unto thee, but that which was from the beginning, that, that certifies it. So I do not see a contradiction in the Bible. I'm not going to write you a new commandment, now here's my new commandment. I don't see that. That would be a contradiction. I see, I don't want to write to you a new commandment. How about this commandment over here that was new back then, that Jesus said, why don't you take that commandment and let's keep it fresh. And let's remember it. And it's not new because we all know it. But if you forgot it, well, it's be new for the people who forgot it. 
I don't think that's stretching it. I think that makes it clearly a quote of Jesus and not a contradiction. And I think it clearly shows that in his mind, he was remembering what Jesus said was the most important commandment to love one another. Okay, so there in verse 8, Again, a new commandment I wrote unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. Now, the true light is Jesus. But Paul talks about the light of the gospel. Do you think he might have been thinking about that too? It sounds like John was a reader, because he was a writer too. And so he's probably thinking about the light of the gospel, and how Jesus is the light, how the word of God gives light. Probably, all these things are probably in his mind as he's writing this. Verse 9, He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of a stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. Now why all of a sudden does he take verse 8, and then tie it in with 9, 10, and 11, and darkness, light, and hate? Why is he talking about love and hate? And why is the hate having to do with hating the brethren? Well, we just read the context of the book of John, and Jesus said that. And Jesus said you're not supposed to hate your brethren. But look at this. Look at this, Leviticus chapter 19. In the Old Testament law, we see something. A lot of people read through their Bible and not realize the cross-references. And that's why it's so important, cross-reference. I love a good cross-reference. A cross-reference is whenever you find some passage of Scripture looking to see where is that in the other parts of the Bible. So, getting this all together, John's saying, I don't want to write to you a new commandment. He says, now here's a commandment for you that was new at one time. This new commandment I write to you, reminding you of what was already written. And you go back and you find that in Scripture. You find that in the book of John, the commandment of Jesus to love one another. And not hate your brother. Okay, we look at that and we look at Jesus and we say, wonder where Jesus got that from. Did that just come off the top of Jesus' head? Or was Jesus quoting the law? Did you know that the law says that you're not supposed to hate your brother? Leviticus chapter 19. I was surprised when I read this because I completely forgot. But look what it says. Leviticus 19 verse 17 and 18 says this. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt not in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. So when Jesus quotes that in the book of John, he's quoting Leviticus. When John in the book of 1 John quotes Jesus, he's quoting Jesus, who's quoting. So you've got a double quote there. It's pretty amazing. And so obviously this must be in the heart and in the mind of John when he's writing 1 John. And he's saying, now remember that commandment of old? It was commanded under the law, this, love your neighbor and don't hate, and it's a commandment over here that we should love and not hate. And then all through the rest of what we're about to read in 1 John, it's all about love, love, love. So we have the Old Testament command under the law. We have the the ministry of Jesus. We have a command here in Jesus' ministry to love one another and don't hate your brethren. And then we have the command here under the age of grace. So here's what we have, an example of a triple command. It was a command to Israel in the Old Testament of the law. It was a command to his disciples. And it was a command of the apostles. So it was a command to Jews. It was a command to the disciples of Jesus. And it's a command to the church today. Love one another and don't hate the brethren. Don't be mean and hateful and wow. I just, I just, wow, that, to me, that, that just threw my heart. Because I've always wanted to be the type of Christian who's not angry, who's not mean, who's not hateful, who doesn't attack and put down other people. Now, there's a place and a time to rebuke others when they sin. We looked at that last week, and I told you the story about Nelson and how I had to go door to door and knock on doors and say, Nelson's in sin. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that he told you all he was a Christian because he's not acting like one. 
But I don't hate him. I didn't do it because I hate the guy. Because I loved him and I wanted him to do right. All right, so we are supposed to love one another. 1 John 2, 11. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whether he goeth because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. Now look at 3.15. 1 John 3.15. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Oh, that sounds like you can lose it. Mm, you think so? 1 John 4.20 If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? So there must have been, in the time of the early apostles, remember Peter and the early apostles were the first, and John was there too. But then you got Paul. But then Paul dies and the last apostle is John. But all throughout this church age, we see a horrible thing. We see division among the early church. And we see people angry at one another that claim to be Christians and fighting. And that's not something that's good. Could there have been a lot of hate going on during the time of John? And so that's why John is writing that? Hey, don't hate on each other? Well, that would make sense. Remember, 2 Timothy 1.15, Paul says, They in Asia turned against me, Paul. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 4 and verse 11, remember who's writing. John is writing the book of Revelation to the seven churches in Asia, the ones that turned against Paul. Maybe they hated Paul for some reason. Maybe they said, Paul, we hate you. We hate. And so maybe John is saying, hey guys, you need to stop hating on Paul. <laughs> that could be part of the reason why he's saying that. But in Paul's day, there was divisions. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul says when he was a minister, he came across people that got saved, true, Bible-believing, born-again children of God, but they got in the flesh instead of walking in the Spirit, and they started to hate on one another and be mean to each other. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is Paul speaking, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly, perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Oh, we as Christians, we shouldn't be contentious, but some Christians are. They like only to be contentious have contentions, 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 I put it in Spanish, contentions, there we go, but we shouldn't be contentious as Christians, verse 12, now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ, is Christ divided, was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul, I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, and on and on and on, so let's go to Acts chapter 20, so you have what I like to call camps. And unfortunately, all the early Christians couldn't stick together and work together. They got together in their little camps or their little groups. And they became groupies. What Christian are you? Well, I'm the Pauline Christian. I follow Paul. What Christian are you? Well, I'm a follower of Apollos. What Christian are you? Well, I'm a follower of this guy. And that's not... No, no. We're all supposed to be followers of Christ, but through Paul and the early apostles. But they wanted to be a follower of a man. you got to watch out for that. Let's go to Acts chapter 20. I don't want to be a man follower. I want to be a follower of Christ, Jesus. But I've shown you as much as I can that the way you follow Jesus today is through these other apostles. And the one who said he's the apostle to the Gentiles, who said, Be followers of me as I am of Christ, is Paul. And Paul said, Follow me as I follow Christ. So if I have to follow a man, then the man that I'm supposed to follow is Paul, because the revelations that Jesus wanted the church to have were given to Paul, and then there were some given to John. So I do have to follow a man in the sense that I need to follow Paul, but I don't want to follow another man. You know what I'm saying? Because men can be wrong. Paul was wrong. We even see that in the Bible where Paul was doing wrong by going back to Jerusalem when God said not to do it. But we also understand that the scripture that we have from Paul, the Holy Spirit and God spoke through him. So we look at the scripture as God given. The Holy Spirit penned the words that Paul spoke. 
Now look this real quick. Acts chapter 20, verse 30. Acts chapter 20 and verse 30, Paul says this. Actually, let's look at verse 29 also. Acts 20, 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. So, they want to draw away disciples after them. Men. Men want people to follow them. You know, I don't ask people to follow me. I never have and I never will. But a lot of people, they want to follow a man. And in the Christianity that I'm from, I'm an independent Baptist. You have all these camps. Many of the camps are based upon which Bible school you went to. Which Bible school did you go to? Or... Which preacher do you follow the most? Who is your favorite preacher? I went on what's called deputation for three years as a minister who was going to Honduras as a missionary. And I preached in over 200 churches, going around to these different churches. And the first thing that most pastors would ask me is, well, what camp are you in? And I go, excuse me, what do you, what do you mean by that? Well, where'd you go to Bible school? Did you go to Tennessee Temple? Did you go to Crown College? Did you go to, uh, I don't even know what they are, Bob Jones University? Or did you go to, who? I don't even remember all that, Pacific Coast or something? Or, or did you go over to Hiles Anderson? Or did you go to, and there's all these Bible institutes or Bible colleges. Did you go to PCC? That's another good one. And they said, which camp are you in? Which school did you go to is what they're referring to. Or... Which uh, preacher are you from? Are you Hiles? Are you uh, 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 Rice? Are you this guy? I went to a Bible school that was Peter Ruckman's Bible school. And a lot of people, they'll call that group, they'll say, those are Ruckmanites. You know I've never called myself a Ruckmanite. I don't even care to call myself that because Peter Ruckman taught me, you're a Bible believer, be a Bible believer. He said, follow the Lord and follow Paul, don't follow me. I am so blessed to have gone to school and learned the Bible, but I don't want to be his camp. I don't want to be, oh, I am from him, and you can't fellowship with me unless you're part of my group. No, if you're saved, then I'm saved, and we're both Bible believers, rightly dividing and believing the truth. It doesn't matter to me what camp you're in. So oftentimes I'd go to these churches and preach for these men, and the thing they'd ask me is, what camp are you in, Breaker? Because a lot of times they look at you like, I can't fellowship with you if you're not from my Bible school. Or if you're one of those preachers that I don't like, it's on my list of those that I don't like, I can't fellowship with you. And so they say, so what camp are you in? You know what I tell them? I say, brother, I'm a Bible believer. And you really want to know what camp I'm in? They say, yeah, yeah, what camp are you in? I say, brother, the book of Hebrews says to be without the camp with Jesus. And that's the camp I'm in. I'm in Camp Jesus. And rather than go into a camp with a whole bunch of men... I just decided I'd come out with Jesus. Because the church of Laodicea is a whole bunch of people in a church, and Jesus is knocking on the door saying, I'd like to get in there, but all these men are following all these men, and they've kicked God out. I said, Brother, I'm without the camp with Jesus. How about you? <laughs> and a lot of times the pastor goes, go, Oh, uh, you, you know what I meant. I go, I know what you meant. But I said, that's, that's the camp that I'm in. I'm the camp that's without the camp with Jesus. Because I want to get closer to Him rather than get closer to a man. Amen? So I've always had a problem with this exalting men too high and following of men. A lot of men are saying, follow me, follow me. Uh, a lot of guys out there, they're trying to get disciples after them. So they're trying to, to make it about you and me. Well, you know what? It's not about you and it shouldn't be about me. It should be about Jesus and following him. How do we follow Jesus today? Through Paul. Through the revelations given to Paul. There's some revelations given to John. There's some given to Peter. and But we should follow the New Testament. A lot of people say, well, you're just a Ruckmanite. You went to Ruckman school. And, I, and I'm like, please don't call me that. I, I'm not offended. I'm not ashamed of where I went to Bible school. But I don't want people to think that I'm a follower of a man. I want people to know that I'm a follower of this right here. And I love that guy. I appreciated that guy for teaching me the Bible. I mean, he wasn't sinless. Amen. He was pretty critical, hard to talk to, and stuff like that. I don't hate him. I love him. But I don't need to piggyback off of his ministry either. 
And I'm not looking for our basis of fellowship is, you have to come to me only if you accept the man that taught me the Bible. That, that would be utterly ridiculous, wouldn't it? So I just don't believe in this men worship. And I've seen it too much, and it just it, it hurts me to see Christians, oh, well, you're not part of our group, so we can't have anything, to, and, and they're following men. And so I've decided, you know what, I'm not a, a man follower, I'm a Bible believer. And if you believe the King James Bible, and you believe the doctrine of the blood atonement for salvation, then you and I can fellowship. It doesn't matter what man taught us. What matters is that we have our basis of fellowship around this book. Amen. So anyway, I went a little long on that, but let's go back to 1 John chapter 2. And he talks there about hating your brother. And there's a lot of people in this world that, that hate certain men that were preachers. And I don't want to get caught up in that. I don't want to get caught up in hating or saying, well, I can't fellowship with you because you're not part of my group or stuff like that. I'm not going to go that route. Not going to go that route. Okay, First John, uh, let me just tell you this story I got to real quick. I went to one church one time, and this pastor, he says, come on in, Breaker. He says, sit down, boy. And I sat down in his house and his couch, and he just went off on me. You went to this school, and this guy's pastor is your pastor, and he's wrong, and I think it. And he just went off on me because I came from a certain Bible school, and my pastor was a certain man that he didn't like. And when he was all done... He goes, well, what do you think? And I went, well, brother, if you have a problem with him, I'll give you his phone number and you can call him and take it up with him. I'm not him. And it was just the funniest thing because the guy goes, well, <sighs> all right, brother. <laughs> it's, I finally realized all he wanted me to do was to fight back. And he wanted to start an argument and he wanted to be contentious. And he couldn't wait for me to try to, because he wanted to argue, and I didn't. And he was disappointed, <laughs> he cracks me up, that I was like, well, okay, well, brother, I'm not him, so you can't judge me based upon how he was. Can I tell you more about who I am or where I come from? Because I'm not him. And that, it was just funny to me, and it helped me to realize, look, the, the greatest tool of the devil is division. And to get Christians to, to have fights and strife and, and contentions and things like that. And the Bible says, leave off contention before it be meddled with. And it was just fun to me to just to just stop it, you know. Because he was like, and this guy, and he's, and I, so what do you think? I said, I think you should have his number and call him. Here, I'm going to write it down for you. And you take that up with him. But why are you talking to me about him? I'm not him. I was here to have fellowship with you, brother. I love you, man. I want to know more about you. Um, I'm here to preach and give the gospel and, and, and teach the Bible. Can we have some fellowship? You know, it was just it was just fun for me. I've uh, been many times like that when I've gone to a church and met a pastor. And it seems like all he wanted to do was talk bad about somebody. And I've just remembered verses said, Brother, you know the Bible says we're not supposed to hate a brother. The Bible says we're supposed to love one another in meekness and kindness and charity, brother. Brother, I know you might not like him, but you got to love him. And a lot of times the pastor would be like, yeah, yeah, all right. <laughs> oh, well, that's just what we got to do. Amen. All right. So 1 John chapter 2, verse 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Well, there we go back to the name again. Okay. Remember the who versus what? A lot of times John is bringing up the name of Jesus. That's why I say it sounds like it's going to be a book that has kind of a double application to where after the rapture it goes back to all about who Jesus is. And that's what I call the difference between the who and the what of salvation. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then you need to uh, see that video on YouTube, the difference between the who and the what of salvation, and uh, you need to see some of the other videos. But um, <clears throat> he mentions here that you are forgiven. So notice, remember when we went through uh, chapter 1, verse 9? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. People try to twist that and say, nope, you're not saved unless you confess. No, it's not saying salvation is through confession. It's saying even if you do confess, we're still forgiven. Because here we have this verse, verse 12, in chapter 2, that says your sins are forgiven you. And when we're saved, our sins are forgiven, Ephesians 1, 7. And then we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins, even the forgiveness of sins. So John mentions the blood, and I see Paul mentioning the blood. Remember, Paul, it's all about Paul 
And Paul is talking about the blood atonement. And the message of Paul is that Christ Jesus saves. And Romans 3.25 says we must put our faith in the blood of Jesus. Romans 5.11 talks about receiving the atonement. So it's through faith in the blood atonement. Well, as you go through the books of John, you see the blood. Now, it doesn't talk about it a lot in the Gospel of John. But in 1 John, we can't go seven verses without him mentioning the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin in chapter 1. We also see the blood in chapter 5. In chapter 5, 1 John 5, 6 through 8. What does it say? 1 John 5, 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. So he mentions the blood. Now, he also wrote the book of Revelation, and look at Revelation 1.5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Whew. Washed in the blood. That is Pauline doctrine, and it's found in John. So John does agree with Paul. All right, We take John where he agrees with Paul, and that's for us today. Now, there are some passages we're going to get to that don't sound like they agree with Paul. The only place they would fit would be over here. So that's why I say John has a dual application. Church age doctrine, and after the rapture, there'll be some doctrine in there for the Jews. So you've got to remember that. Paul's message is faith in the blood, faith in the blood, faith in the blood. Well, did uh, John here teach faith? Well, yeah, 1 John 5.4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Faith in what? Verse 6, he that came by water and blood. So it's through faith that we're saved. And I see that message in Paul, and I clearly see that message here in John as well. First John. All right, now let's go to verse 13. Verse 13, I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him, that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you little children because you have known the Father. So he, he says, I write unto you what? Fathers, young men, little children. There are seven stages of Christian growth in the Bible. I find this very interesting, so let me write that up here. The seven stages of Christian growth. And let's ask... Which one are you, if you're saved? And I just, I find that there's so many sevens in the Bible that I just can't help but do this here. The first is a babe. Then, here he uses little children. Then we have children, which are older, I guess, older children. Then young men. Then we have fathers. Then we have elders. Then we have the aged. And let's go ahead and look up some verses that mention these. And it is mentioned in the Bible, okay? Uh, look up 1 Corinthians 3, 1. We'll go there first. Then we have 1 John 2, 1, where we saw little children. Uh, Galatians 3, 26. 1 John 2, 13. 1 John 2, 13, 1 Timothy 5, 17, and Philemon 1, 9. I think that's right. Let's hope I got the references right here. When you get saved, you become a babe in Christ. That means you're a new baby. So just as you're physically born and grow and go through stages... In the Bible, there are some stages that you spiritually go through because salvation is a new birth. You're born again. Well, you're born as a baby. And in 1 Corinthians 3, 1, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So when you get first saved, you're a babe in Christ. All right? Now, hopefully, you'll grow. Now, how do you grow? Well, how does a baby grow? With milk. So the Bible says to desire the sincere milk of the Word. So the way you grow as a Christian is you get in the book. You get in the Bible and you read. 
Now, 1 John 2, 1, we read, my little children. You grow and you become a little child. How do you grow? The more you read the Bible, the more you know, the more you grow as a Christian. Then in Galatians 3, 26, look what he says. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26, for we are all, I believe this is right, I don't want to quote it wrong, 326, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So you grow up. You should grow up. If you just got saved last week, you're a babe in Christ. Don't be a babe in Christ still after being saved for two or three or four or five years. You should grow. I mean, if you're someone who's been saved for five years, you should be farther down than up here as a babe in Christ. The more you learn of the Bible, the more you mature as a Christian. Then it says, young men, 1 John 2, 13. I run into you fathers, um, little children. Uh, let's see, is it 15? 2, 13. Run into you fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I run into you young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. Okay, so here's the young men. And here's the next one, the father. So they're both in the... So you get older and you're a young man in Christ. You should know a lot of Bible. Then you get married and you're a father. You should be someone who is teaching others the Bible. Then 1 Timothy 5.17 says, 1 Timothy 5.17, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. And then Philippians 1.9. Philippians 1.9. Yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such as one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. So you start out as a babe in Christ. On July 29th, 1992, I got saved at 18 years old. I was a babe in Christ. I began reading my Bible and growing and growing. Then as a young man, 18, 19, 20 years old, I actually went out and started preaching on the street. And then I got stronger and learned more. I joined Bible school. I began to learn. And, and I began to pastor a church while I was in Bible school. An elder is a pastor. And now I've been working as an evangelist, as a missionary evangelist. I was a missionary in Honduras for seven years. And I'm not that old yet. I'm not as old as John was when he died, probably 100 years old. But I'll get there one day if the rapture doesn't come. But I'm going through these stages of growth. Where are you? Did you just get saved? Well, you need to mature. You need to grow. You need the Word, the milk of the Word. And you need to learn your Bible. All right, now go back here to uh, 1 John 2. And verse 14, I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. Okay, so this would be the early church fathers that would have known Jesus, that would have been alive during the time of Jesus. Now, did they see Jesus? Maybe, maybe not. But they were alive around the time of Jesus. And then it says, I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Who is the wicked one? The wicked one is the devil. Let's look at some verses on that. The wicked one is this, all right? Wicked one is a reference to the devil. But it also can be a reference to the Antichrist. And I want to show you a verse on that. So let's look at this. Let's go to 1 John 3.12. 1 John 3.12. Not as Cain, who was, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and whereof slew he him, because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. So there's the wicked one. There's the devil. Well, clearly we remember that the devil tempted Cain, and that's what happened. Uh, 1 John 5.18, look what it says here. 1 John 5.18 says, We know that whatsoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. So as a Christian, we can do right and live right, and when we do, well, it seems like that we're protected from the devil if we're doing right and living right. Now, the devil's always going to try, but maybe we reach the maturity level that we're so mature that we're not going to fall into sin, but <laughs> that's kind of hard. I mean, it's hard to, but the more you live right and do right, the easier it becomes to live right and do right. Ephesians 6.16 Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Well, that, of course, would be the devil and his minions. Now, 2 Timothy 2.8. I said 2 Timothy, my bad. 2 Thessalonians 2.8. 2 Thessalonians 2.8 says, 
says this. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Now wait a minute. That's a capital W. Wow. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now notice that's a capital W. Well, you look there in verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. This is the tribulation period, which I believe is seven years. And the Bible divides up the Antichrist as the man of sin and the son of perdition. Well, Judas was also called the son of perdition. And the Bible says the devil entered into him. So we have a reference here of the Antichrist, but it gives him a capital W. Why? Because I believe it's talking about this time in which it's a man who is the Antichrist, but he's possessed with the devil, and so it gave you a capital W to show you it's this part of the tribulation, the last three and a half years, not before. I just find that very interesting in the King James Bible. So, interesting thought there. Well, let's go back to 1 John chapter 2. I'm getting tired here. 1 John chapter 2. And it says here, verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, if, here's the word if again, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Well, that's not saying he's not saved. That's just saying you don't have the same love that the Father does because the Father loved the world enough to die for it. Now, you're loving the world enough that you want it. No, you shouldn't want the world. Um, God doesn't want the world. God wants to save people out of the world. But anyway, it says, verse 16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So here we have three things listed, and I find this very interesting, these three things. And it's a warning, and it's a caution against these three things, and it has to do with lust. It's the lust of the flesh, it's the lust of the eyes, and it's the pride of life. Now, it's interesting he mentions three things. Because you remember over there in 1 Thessalonians 5.23 that we have a body, a soul, and a spirit? When I looked at those, I always thought, does that line up? The lust of the flesh, Why that? could that be the body? The body that we're in is a sinful body that wants certain things. Lust of the eyes, could you want something with all your soul? Perhaps, the Bible says the light of the body is the eye. <laughs> soul. And the pride of life, would that be spirit? I don't know. I mean, that's to me, that's just a question mark on all of those, because I don't know. But it just, you know, there's some people that they're in the flesh and doing wrong all the time. There's some people that down to their very soul, they're wicked. <laughs> and of their own soul, they just want to do wrong. But then there's some people that have a spirit of evil. And it might even be an evil spirit in them making them do evil. The Bible warns us about pride. But there's a word used twice, and that's lust. And the Bible warns us about lust. What is lust? Lust, according to the 1828 dictionary, is a longing desire, concupiscence, carnal appetite, depraved affections, unlawful desire of carnal pleasure. So lust is wanting to be in the flesh and do evil things in the flesh, like fornication. So we that are Christians, we're supposed to get away from that. We're supposed to get away from lust. Let's run some verses real quick on lust. If you don't know what lust is, then well, you're probably lying. <laughs> Most people know what lust is, even if you've never looked it up in the dictionary. You see someone, and, and let's say you're a man, and you see a pretty woman in a bikini or something, and you start to look at her, and you can't take your eyes away, and you start to think things about her that you shouldn't, and you lust after your heart. You know that's a sin, don't you? Well, that's lust, and you know that's wrong. And you start getting this appetite in your flesh. You start thinking, well, I wish I could have that. That's sin. That's lust. Psalms 81 and verse 12 says this. So I gave them up unto their own hearts lusts, that they walked in their own counsels. And God says, so these evil people, they did evil, so I, and they lusted all the time, so I gave them up to their own hearts lusts. He said, they want that, they can have that, if that's what they want to be. But what is God saying? He's saying, I don't want them to be like that. I don't want people to lust. I want them to do right. 
So our flesh wants to lust, but as Christians, we're supposed to walk a certain way. We're supposed to get away from lust. Proverbs 6.25 says this, Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. Who is this? It's a strange woman. It's an evil woman, a wicked woman. Matthew chapter 5. Go over to Matthew now. So all throughout the Bible, it's don't lust, don't lust, don't lust. Yet today, lust is everywhere. Pornography is all over. Television, horrible about showing sex scenes and things like this. And it's all to entice you with lust. That's to get you in the flesh. And if we're saved, we're to walk in the Spirit of God, not in the lust of the flesh. Matthew 5, 28. Jesus says, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So we're not supposed to commit adultery. Let me give you another example of lust. So all throughout the Bible, lust is something that God is very much against and, and prohibits and says, Don't be lustful. Yet there are a lot of people that are lustful. It's sad. And as a Christian, we shouldn't be. Romans 1.27 says this, And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was met. What is this? Well, I'm sure you know what the context is. If not, read the whole passage. But this is a lust. And so it's not right to lust. 1 Corinthians 10.6 Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. 1 Thessalonians 4.5 So God doesn't want us to lust. 1 Thessalonians 4.5 God wants us to flee useful lusts. 1 Thessalonians 4.5 says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. That was verse 4. 5. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. So he's saying the people that aren't saved, man, they lust a lot. Well, after you're saved, you, you shouldn't lust. Why? Why is it harder to lust as a Christian? Because we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. The Bible says, grieve not the Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed until the day of redemption. When we sin as Christians and we lust, the Holy Spirit grieves within us and goes, Oh, don't do that. Don't do Oh, no, oh, don't sin. You ever have that feeling as a Christian and you did something you shouldn't? Or maybe you're lusting in your heart and you just have this, oh, I don't want to do that inside you. 2 Peter 2.10 But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanliness and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignity. So lust leads always to fornication. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 6. And fornication is uncleanliness. You actually become dirty when you give in to lust and you do fornicate. You can get diseases, horrible diseases, that can kill you. STD, sexually transmitted diseases. 1 Corinthians 6.13 Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So don't fornicate. Verse 18 Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. So not, in, not only against the Lord, but against your own body. Uh, chapter 7, verse 2, 1 Corinthians, Nevertheless, to avoid, avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Galatians 5, 19. If you know your Bible, you know that you're not supposed to lust, you're not supposed to commit adultery, you're not supposed to fornicate. I've met people that said they're Christians, and they're still living in fornication. And, well, I've been living with her with years. I just got saved. We're not married yet. Okay, take the next step. Grow up. Get married. Read your Bible. Mature as a Christian. Don't live in fornication. That's a bad testimony as a Christian. Galatians 5.19 Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, and it goes on and on and on. Colossians 3.5 so, I'm just trying to throw that out there and hoping this will be a blessing to you because when we're saved, we're supposed to try to do right. And look what it says of Colossians 3.5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinance, affection. Well, that would be what? Lust. Evil concupiscence. Yeah, that's one of the definitions of lust, concupiscence. And covetousness, which is idolatry. Mortify, therefore, the members of your flesh. As Jesus sacrificed his flesh on the cross, 
you are to sacrifice your flesh and to put down sinful desires. Get married, have a wife, or if you're a woman, have a husband, so that you can fulfill the desires of the flesh correctly, the right way, through that union as a married couple, not the wrong way as someone who's not married. Because sex outside of marriage is sin, according to the Bible. All right, so First John, and you realize something? We're almost to a point in this world where you can go to jail for saying something like that. And yet, that is what the Bible teaches. I've read stories of pastors that were arrested who said marriage is between a man and a woman, and sex outside of marriage is sin. And they were arrested somewhere like in the UK or someplace for saying something like that. And all they were doing was just teaching the Bible and saying, hey, if you have sex outside of marriage, it's sin. And the world hates that so much that they're willing to put people in jail. Isn't that sad? Well, I'm just going to keep preaching what the Bible says. It doesn't bother me a bit that you don't like it. It just proves the Bible is true, that you're one of those in the flesh led by seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, and, and you want to believe the lie rather than the truth. But the truth is, the happiest people in the world are those who are faithful to their spouses and uh, enjoy clean living. Amen? Have no skeletons in their closet. Amen? So, back to 1 John chapter 2. I doubt we'll get through this whole chapter this time. We'll go ahead and stop there in verse 17, I believe. And it says there, well, let's go back and read what, everything here from verse 7 all the way down to verse 17. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning, which is, again, a new commandment I write unto you. He's quoting what was back there. Which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. He that saith, he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. Yeah. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Love is a great thing. It keeps us from stumbling because we care about other people. That's what it's supposed to be. Rather than hating them and putting them down and attacking them and being contentious. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. So he's writing to some really good Christians, it sounds like. And he's telling them now, make sure you continue being a good Christian. Don't fall into sin. Get away from it. Prove what a true Christian is. Why is he saying that? As we get on further into this teaching, we're going to see that there's the true church, and then there's a false church, the Gnostics, who have tried to enter into the church and get people out and have started a false religious system based upon Gnosticism. And I've told you that before, that the Gnostics are the evil ones. But it says here in verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Well, there's another verse that people say, Oh, see, if you do right, then you'll abide forever. You'll have eternal life. And they try to make it a works gospel. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Not with what Paul said. Not with what John is saying in other places. What is he saying? He's saying, if you do right, then you'll get rewards in heaven. And that's going to abide forever. I don't see him saying that based upon your works, you get eternal life. That's not what he's saying. But if someone were to take this out of context, that's what they would try to pre preach. So you got to watch out for people that do that. So next time we'll start in verse 18 and uh, look at that, and hopefully we'll finish. There's a lot to get into, and I'm going to have to erase all this in order to put something else up here, because we're going to have to have quite a chart to get up to this. And we'll probably get into the Gnostics, because there in verse um, 19, he said, there were, there were some that were not of us that went out from us. Those are the Gnostics that got in for a little while and pretended to be Christians and then ended up leaving and drawing men uh, away as disciples after them and starting their false line of Christianity, a very carnal and a very wicked 
type of Christianity, all based upon the flesh in a works gospel instead of a gospel of faith in the blood of Christ. So I can't wait to get into that next time, and we're going to look at the Gnostics and who they are and what they taught. And I think you'll learn a lot. So we'll see you next time. God bless. Bye-bye.